Hi guys, welcome to Learning Electronics Repair. This video was actually recorded, or this section you're going to see now, as part of a car boot video, car boot flea market retro PCs. So these are the computers I found at the local flea market, and we look at them. Usually there's no major problems with them, but it's just interesting because it's retro hardware. But this one turned out to have a really interesting fault on it. And it took me a little while to get to the bottom of it, so I thought we'd give this a video on its own. There's lots to learn in this one. I will show you on paper as well as on the board what I'm doing, how I'm coming to the conclusions I am coming to from the measurements I'm making, yeah? So this is another good example of how to think it through when you have a fault. I won't say anything more about what the fault is right now. You can just watch the video, hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you all at the end. And here is the next one. Older machine, as you can see. Yeah, not in the uh, best of condition. <laughs> I mean, it looks like it's been run over by a truck, basically, this thing. So, I don't know what we're going to find inside here. There's four USBs. I mean, if it's an old machine, it might be something like a Pentium 4. Let's see if we can get this. So, yeah, this just comes off. And it's something like that. Yeah, I think this is a, yeah. In fact, this is a Pentium 4, 4, 7, 8. You can see it in there. So let's have a closer look at this one. In fact, then, this is a Asus motherboard P for V800, so this is the 800 megahertz front side buzz. This is the fastest that you could get in this generation. Socket 478 could have one of the fastest processors in there, which is worth more than the motherboard if it does have. Well, as I mentioned before, that's the 3.4 gig, and I've only ever found one. And I sold it for over 100 pounds. Okay, so I think I'll just uh, take this thing apart. I want to see what's in it really, and. Check the motherboard, it has a hard drive, considering this thing looks like it's been run over by a truck. I'm not sure if that will work, but hey, we can try, yeah. Uh, graphics card, little AGP card, with a little fan on it, but I don't think it'll be anything very exciting, but we can get that out as well, and then let's see what we have. Here's the motherboard. First thing I notice is it has some bad capacitors on it. We can just have a quick look, but we're gonna to have to change these anyway. So we can see one clearly bad one here. I'm sure you can all recognize these easily by now. And there's another three here. Probably all the ones of that type, if there are others, are probably all bad. I mean, we can see that these are different, so the ones which are bad are the 6.3 volts, so these will be on the low voltage side of these VRMs. That'll be the CPU vCore. I'm not sure what it was on these, to be quite honest. The other capacitors, which are next to them, these will probably be 16 volts, if we can see the markings on them. Well, in fact, they mounted in such a position that it makes that difficult. Probably if I take the heatsink off, which I'm going to have to do. But I think I can just make out 16 volts down there. Yeah, 16 volts. So these will be on the 12 volt supply. So we have here, come on, focus. Yeah. These are your MOSFETs for your VRMs, your coil. So these capacitors, the 16 volts are on the 12 volt, the input side. And these are on the output, which is, I don't know, a couple of volts or something maybe for these processors. And these are the ones which are subjected to the high frequency spikes from the switching circuit. That's one of the reasons why these fail. And the other reason basically that they were just made badly around this era. There was a plague of these bad capacitors. It's not age, it's just that there was a manufacturing defect basically. I may as well change, I mean, those three are visibly gone, so I may as well change that one while I'm at it, and then it looks like this one and this one are in parallel as well. I'll change at least that one. Sometimes what I do is I change the visibly bad ones first, and if the motherboard then works, I'll just change the others anyway. So that means I'm using less capacitors. 
if it turns out the board's actually faulty in some other way anyway, which it can't be repaired maybe. So one way or the other, I'll get that sorted now. The processor, we may as well have a look since the heatsink's got to come off to change these anyway. Came off easily. <laughs> There's your processor with a paper sticker on it. Yeah, that obviously helps the uh, heat transfer. Yeah. At least it looks like they put some thermal compound on the sticker, so maybe that is okay. Somebody thought, yeah. Let's see if this is one of the ones that's worth some money. I doubt it, they're so hard to find the 3.4s. And this is no exception, it's a 2.5. These are really worth not worth selling, shall we say. They're worth not worth. Yeah, they're not worth selling. So that isn't worth anything, unfortunately, but that's usually what I find. Okay, so let's get these capacitors sorted and then we can see if this works. And now I've removed that, you can clearly see these are 1000 microfarad. 16 volts and these are okay while i've got the overhead camera zoomed in we can have a quick look at this so this is a creamy white pearlescent graphics card yeah nice and clean saltec nothing powerful fairly obviously but uh, what is it oh it's an mx400 these are quite common graphics cards to be quite honest there is a GeForce 2 MX and there's a GeForce 4 MX and I think the GeForce 2 is the one that's worth the more money. So a few weeks since I've seen one, I can go and look that up. But somebody might want that just because of the colour of it. If you've got a retro machine, there are some motherboards that were made in this code, not very many. So that might be the sort of thing you want to put into one of those machines. Now let's sort these capacitors. I may as well change all six, I think, then. Just looking at these, so where the negative is, is not the white mark on the silk screen. Sometimes that is a negative. You have to be careful with these boards, yeah, otherwise you'll put them in back to front, and then very rapidly, when you switch on, you'll know about it, yeah. <laughs> so let's just get these out. It's extremely easy to do this. grab the capacitor heat it up but actually put a bit of fresh solder on it first otherwise it won't be extremely easy okay there's one here another one here quite literally get hold of the capacitor in your fingers heat up one end push it in the opposite direction and this leg moves in so i was pushing that away from me heat up this end flick it towards me and now you can probably see the capacitor is not out but it's hanging out okay so we'll go one more time on this end and it'll just come out the board like so next we can go the opposite way if we like, hit this end, pull it towards me, that end, push it away from me, this end towards me, this end, and it's out. Uh, another one, nice and clean. Somebody was saying that this is not a good method to use, that you will possibly pull the wires out of the board, which go into the power planes or ground planes. Personally, that doesn't happen for me. I mean, you've, you've probably seen me do this many times and there's nothing stuck on here. There's no via from the board or anything like that. Yeah, it's all clean look. So in my experience, this is not a bad way. Maybe other people's experiences will differ. Uh, I think we can say quite safely here, we can do this and we'll get six out of six without a problem. Okay. So it's a little bit tight here, so I can't move it very far, but I can move it. Just a bit like doing a 3.2 in a tight space, it becomes a 5.2. 
So again, I'm just hitting each end and turn and just pushing it, okay? Again, clean, nothing came out of the board with it. Okay, nothing there. If the is there, it's like a little collar on the capacitor. You would spot it very easily if you've managed to do something like that. Push it, now I've got a bit of space, this one will come easily. Yep, there again, clean, last two. This is going to be awkward. When you do this, wait for the solder to solidify on one leg before you go to the other one, otherwise you kind of push that leg back into the board again. Okay, it's going loose now. I can feel it, yeah. Another one, perfectly clean, and then the last one. Okay, and the last one, perfectly clean. So, definitely no damage to the board there. Came out nicely, we can look at the other side. So that's where we've taken the capacitors from, there and there, you can see, okay. So now I will clean the holes and then we can fit the replacement capacitors. If you did rip a vire out of the board here, I would suggest that what you do is put the replacement into the spare space, but what I'd really suggest more than that is don't do it in the first place. Yeah, don't damage the board. Okay, let's clean these holes. I have the uh, desoldering gun set at 399 actually. I used to use this at 380 all the time, but I found it was clogging a little bit, so it seems to be that little bit of extra temperature helps. Very nice and clear. My favourite method with this is to use hot air as well and do it the other way around. <laughs> okay, so hot air in my left hand, the soldering gun in my right hand, so I'm right handed. There's actually six, there was two from here and four further over. I miscounted, but I just counted the capacitors, so there's actually six, not seven. Warm it up. Get in with this, give it a few seconds. Yeah, clean. Yeah. Don't let it get too hot. That one didn't go. Okay, that one didn't go. We'll just check it isn't a little bit clogged. No, it's not clogged. So, the troublesome one. A little bit of fresh solder. I can use this like a soldering iron for this. Okay. Okay. A little bit more hot air this time. Warm it a little bit longer. That's got it. That's got that one. Okay, so two down, four to go. And they are here. This was like a heavier plane in this area, so a little bit of extra heat. Okay, I'll just give it a quick run through it with the cleaning tool. Yeah, it's fine, it's clean, it's in. So the one that didn't desolder, just get a little bit of extra solder on it. Okay. bit more heat got it this time a 
Yep, not that one. Got that one. It's working well, but I'll just push the little stick through again. It isn't clogging, so it's working, but I'll just do this as a precaution to some extent. Yeah, that's in. Let's get the last ones. Two more. One more. There you go, guys. No metal. So these are all 1506.3. I'm not sure if I have that value. If I don't, I'll put some 1800s in. Let's check. Well, actually, I do have 1506.3, but they're a different shape, if you like. They're wider, but shorter. Let's look at the leg spacing. Yeah, they're also a different leg spacing, so I'm not sure these are actually going to fit. Well, you can see it does fit almost. It's not pushed down, but... Looks like if I then try to fit the next one. Yeah, it's going to hit that. It's not going to fit well. Okay. So, I think we're going to find all these are actually in parallel with each other. Let's have a look. Okay. Yes. 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 The other end is ground. We know that. So there's only one ground. So they will be together. And then the same here. Yeah. And the two where they're not fitted. Okay. Ground. And then we go to the... Supply rail. You'll probably notice I'm getting the resistance between ground and here. So that looks like a short. That looks very much like a short. I mean, the CPU will have a lowish resistance, but that is really low. Yeah. So this board appears to have a short on the vehicle. That's another thing as well. Not often we find that, but I think we have found one. Well, I'm glad I found that before I actually fitted the capacitors. My intention was to fit two in the spare places. So the 1500 each and we had six. So six times 15 is 75, yeah, or 7,500 microfarads. And if I put eight 1,000s in, which I have physically in this size, I would have 8,000 microfarads, so basically the same. So that's what I was going to do. And then I just realized there's a short here. And it's not the CPU, because that's out. I'll take the RAM out as well, but that's on a different supply rail, so I can't see that being anything to do with why this is reading short. Ground. Short. Okay. So something here has got a short on it. Do we have a short from the 12 volts to the V-core? Let's have a look. So this is your 12 volt connector. If we go to ground. I'm on ohms range, so it won't bleep, but that's reading high no that's but that's really short but one side of the 12 volts is ground anyway that means high that means high 
that's ground. Anyway, this is reading like we have a short circuit low side MOSFET. Let's see if we can find it. So the first thing you'll notice then, there's two phases in this VRM or voltage regulator module. And this is powering the CPU. It may be powering parts of this chip as well. And the reason being, this is the north bridge and this is communicating directly with the CPU. So it's possible part of the circuitry on this chip under here is on the same voltage as vCore. Yeah. That then goes down to the RAM, so that effectively is the memory control. It's between the processor and the RAM. And I think we'll also find, yep, it goes by all these tracks to the AGP. So that's what that chip is doing. It's communicating between the processor and the AGP, and the processor and the RAM. Okay, and it's quite possibly doing some sort of DMA or direct memory access between the VGA and the RAM as well. But that's kind of like just a point of interest. Yeah. What we really want to find out is where's the short. Now you'll see these two coils if you look. This one and this one both connect together onto this track. Okay. And all the capacitors also connect onto this track. So one end, the positive end of all of these capacitors will go to these coils. Okay. To there, 0.4 and ohm. If I read the meter, it's reading about 0.4 anyway. So that is a direct connection. The problem is, if we have a short circuit somewhere in these MOSFETs, and we measure from either of these coils, we'll still see the short because the resistance of this coil from here to here is practically zero. That connects directly to there and from there to there is practically zero. So we can't determine by measuring from this end of the coils to ground where the short is, 0 0.4. 0 0.4. And the three likely places, in fact, the only three places we can have a short is either. A problem in these MOSFETs, one of these pairs will connect from here to ground. The other pair will connect from here to 12 volts. We can see which, actually. So if we go to the 12 volts coming in, okay, that connects to these in parallel, yeah? This is the gate, this is the gate, and then the source here. You can see there's no short there, that MOSFET isn't short, but if it was short, we would see a short from here, and we don't, okay? But this source and this source connecting together. Okay, go to the drains of these two. And then the source of these two will go to ground. And the possibility is we have one of these short circuits or on the other side, you'll see the here we have one of these short circuits or both or both. Yeah, or maybe all of them. But one side probably rather than both, we have a short to ground. The other possibility is that somewhere here, the process is no longer there, but something else being powered to me or a capacitor is short. So if you look across these capacitors under here, you'll see the same short. Right, where is it? Two ways of doing this, really, that mostly come to mind. I mean, probably there are others, I'm sure there are, I've probably done them before, but the two main ways is one, use a low resistance multimeter, something that can measure down to micro ohms. And we should be able to see a difference in the resistance on the side that has the short. So if we read across the capacitors and we have the lowest resistance here, the short is on this side somewhere. If we read from this end of the curl to ground and we have the lowest here, compared with that one, the short is on this and vice versa. If this reads the lowest to ground, the short is on these MOSFETs or a capacitor in this area, okay? So let's get the meter and let's have a look. This is great stuff to learn on, guys, because 
the techniques we use here apply to the latest motherboards. You have more phases, but the principle is exactly the same. Whereas the short on the load or on one of the phases of the VRM, and each phase will have an inductor, even on the latest boards, and the method is the same. So we'll go down to 20 milliohms. This is the lowest range. I'll just zero the meter. It's a little bit unstable on this range, but we need to zero. It may be that this short is higher than 20 milliohms. So I'll connect one end to ground. I'm going to use the same ground point for all of the readings, okay? So I'm going to go here, and we're going to go on this end of the coil. 7.8, 8.5, okay? Go to this one. This is higher. Is it or is it not? You know, on this range, it's not stable enough for, for me to really say. Let's go on the output of the capacitors here. Well, that's not giving us any conclusive readings. I think you can agree with that. I'll go up one range for a bit more stability, but I probably won't see. So that's on zero, okay? Let's go again. Seven point five milliohms, okay. Seven point about the same guys. So I, I can't see I think what I think I can say is it's higher this side on the capacitors, but that might just be because I'm further away from the ground point. Okay. Eight point four. It appears to be lower on this side. And it seems that this is the worst one. Let's try the other method. So this way I'm going to use the ESR meter. Let's get somewhere where you can see it. So this way I'm going to use the ESR meter. Let's power it on. See if we can get it where you can actually see it. Maybe better over here, actually. Yeah, okay, do it this way. So there's the ESR meter. Now, because I'm using long leads, this won't actually zero. But I'm gonna just set the mode, the range, to zero to one ohms, okay? I'll short the leads together, and it won't zero, as you can see. It's reading 1.0, okay? If I tell it to zero, I'll just say error, okay? You can't zero with these long multimeter leads on. 1.08, but let's not worry about the zero. Even. Let's see if we can measure this. So I'm gonna to measure to ground. I'm gonna use a ground that's close to here. Yeah, this will do. And I'm gonna measure again across the capacitors. So that is reading actually lower. 0 0.970 is this thing zeroing a little bit better no funnily enough it isn't it actually means lower now i'm actually sending effectively a 100 kilohertz sine wave into this so it will react differently than it would with a dc meter if i measure through an inductor the inductor will have resistance at this frequency that's just reading open okay try the other one open so i'll try the range above see if this will get more like zero well it's reading about 1.17 just trying zero to get it caught zero 1.11 about the same let's try on our board so we'll connect to ground we'll go onto the capacitors this is the output from the vrm 
0 0.88, 0 0.84. Now, you may wonder why that reads less than when the leads are together. I'm sending a 100 kilohertz sine wave in now. This is not a DC voltage, and it will behave in different ways. Let's go to this end of this one. That's reading 1.00, okay? And this one, 1 1.01, 1 1.00, and from here, I can't see the difference. So in this case, the ESR meter isn't really telling me. The low ohms meter, the micro ohms meter suggests it's on this side, but it wasn't absolutely conclusive. So the next thing to do then is going to be to remove the inductors. I'll try removing this one first because this is where it looks like the short might be. Okay, so it's not very often I burn myself with a soldering iron. In fact, I didn't. That time I rested my thumb on the roll of braid. And you, I think you can just sort of see there and there where it got me across here. Okay, a little indentation. <laughs> it hasn't burnt me badly, it just hurt. Okay, so uh, when that happens to you, it's not just you, I can assure you. Right, let's see if we can see where the short is now. Okay, so we'll go to ground, we'll go from the capacitors. Well, the short's still there. And there's a short still here. What? Ah, oh, the other coil is still in. Okay, but that's a bit strange. Because from that coil to that coil, well, it's going to read short because it's reading through the coil. I would have thought that I wouldn't still see a short here and see a short here. I mean, that's suggesting I have short circuit low side MOSFETs or capacitor here to ground, and I also have the same here to ground, or I have short circuit from here to ground and on the load to ground. So I'm going to have to take this coil out as well. This also probably explains why the milliometer or the ESR meter wasn't giving any particular indication of where the problem is. Because the problem seems to be in more than one place. And that's not normal really. Okay. This time I will try not to suffer any injuries. Again, I have a soldering iron on boost, about 430 degrees, 425, 430. This is coming loose, you can see. Out it comes. Yep, it's on the bench. Desolder braid.
Okay, put the desolder blade where you can't put your finger on it or your thumb. Uh -huh. Right. Now what have we got? Okay. I'm on continuity there now, so it is bleeping now. Well, I wasn't before, I was on resistance. From here. Well, that's the load side, and it's now reading 75 ohms. So am I going to find a short on both of these? Yes. Yes. So it looks like... I have 40 MOSFETs there and there. Let's connect our bench power supply to here and stick a couple of volts in or something like that. The load's now disconnected so the voltage can't go that way. Let's see if something warms up. So the thing is where to inject some current, yeah, where to attach our power supply. The interesting thing is I see a short from here to here. Now the only reason I can see that would happen, thinking at the top of my head, until I prove myself wrong, you know, that's how diagnosis works. So at the moment, the only reason I can see for that is if there's a short here and a short here. I'll draw it on a piece of paper and I'll give you a better idea of what I'm thinking if it's difficult to follow it on the board. Okay, so let's have a look at what we have and what we've been doing and what we can do. We have a VRM with two phases and each phase consists of four MOSFETs and a coil. So this is your 12 volts. I'll draw one of the phases, the MOSFET, another MOSFET to ground. Okay. Now on our board, there's actually two MOSFETs. So in parallel with this one, is another one wired like so this is the gate not much space to draw it that's the gate and that applies to that one and the other ones okay from the 12 volts this is where we had the 16 volt electrolytic capacitors that we were looking at that aren't faulty okay from the junction of these four mosfets we have a coil and that powers V-Core, the power supply to the CPU. Here is where we found, oops, draw these upside down. Here's where we found all the barred capacitors. There were six of them, three on each coil, okay? To make the diagram easy to understand, I'll draw this other one the other way around. So again, we have the 12 volts, which is the same 12 volts as that. Look, it's the same, yeah. Again, it has the 16 volt capacitors on it. And we have two pairs of MOSFETs. To ground. Okay, and from the junction, we have the same thing. We have the coil connecting to V core, and we have some more of these electrolytic capacitors, all the ones that were bulged as I removed. This V core goes CPU, okay almost certainly goes to the north bridge as well so the north bridge will have several power supply rails it will have one which is the same voltage that the cpu is on because it's talking to the cpu it'll have another voltage rail which is the same voltage that the ram is using because it's talking to the ram it'll have a third voltage rail which is the same voltage as the agp slot because it's talking to the agp and it may have a fourth one as well 
just for its own use, okay? So three or four power rails. But one will be this one. And also on V-Core, we're gonna find a large quantity of little ceramic capacitors, those little square ones, the uh, surface mount ones you see everywhere, to ground, and there'll be many of those, okay? So what did I have? Well, I had a slightly incomplete diagram, so there we go. From here, V-Core to ground, I see a short, okay? From here, the junction of these two MOSFETs, I see a short. From here, this junction, I see a short. Now, the reason for that is that to your multimeter, these are extremely low resistance these inductors, they're practically a piece of wire. So this point, this point, V-Core, and this point, as far as your multimeter is concerned, are all connected together. So regardless of where the short is, whether this is short or the one that's in parallel with it, the same whether that's short, whether there's a short on the CPU circuit, I've taken the CPU out, maybe there's a short in this, maybe one of these many capacitors is short, those I've already removed, so they're not there. But wherever the short is, you would still see a short from there to ground, from there to ground, and from there to ground. You wouldn't be able to distinguish where the short is. What we do know is that there isn't a short here or here. And the reason we know that is because if we measure from 12 volts to ground, we see a high resistance, kilo ohms. So there is not a short there either side, okay? Otherwise we'd see a short from here to ground as well. So we know that what is okay, or at least not short. So the way I would normally get around this problem, where is the short? Well, I would do it one of two ways, the two ways I tried. The first way is to use the micro ohm meter. So a very sensitive ohm meter, I measure from here to ground, I measure from here to ground, and I measure from here to ground. And whichever of the three gives me the lowest resistance as where the short is. It doesn't tell me which capacitor, for example, it just tells me that's where the short is. The same, it doesn't tell me which MOSFET, if it is a MOSFET. What we can be certain is that there are no capacitors wired here or there. And that's because this is a high frequency switching circuit, a buck converter. The last thing you want there or here are capacitors, okay? That is effectively preventing it to work the way it should work. So we know there's no capacitor here which could be short, right? What do I see on the micro-ohmmeter? They all read the same. I couldn't determine one way or another. And the way that should work is this will have some resistance. If this has five milliohms of resistance, then if I measure from here to ground and the short is there, I will read five milliohms more than if I read from there to ground because I'm reading the resistance of the coil. Okay, makes sense. Couldn't determine where the short was. Next thing then, I use the ESR meter. So I'm measuring from here to ground and from here to ground and from here to ground. And they all read the same. The way the ESR meter is working is that effectively it sends 100 kilohertz AC into the circuit. And at 100 kilohertz, this coil will have some resistance quite probably an ohm or more of resistance, okay? So if the short is over here and I measure from here to ground, I'm measuring through that coil, which may add an extra one ohm to the reading. The same if I'm reading from here. If the short's over here, then I will read the lowest reading here and so on. Because from here, again, I'm reading through a coil. It wasn't happening. I'm getting the same reading everywhere. Where's the short? Well, that's a very good question. So what did I do? I removed that coil and I removed that coil. And what did I find? Well, I found that now on v core is about 85 ohms to ground. So 
there's no short in this there's no short around here so I think okay well the short is either here or it's here yeah, one pair of MOSFETs or the other what do I find there there short there there short there am I seeing the same short from both places I can't be those curls are no longer there we know these are not short so I can't really be seeing the same short unless maybe we have a short to the gate but we'd have to have a short gate on both of them which means we've got a fault on both sides anyway so that's where we're up to so where do we inject the voltage well we inject it there we inject it there yeah we apply the voltage there and there the fault appears to be on both sides but there might be another way we can figure out where this is so across here as i mentioned before and the same across this one we have another mosfet in parallel okay so if i measure from the gate to ground on both of these and from the gate to ground on both of these if i see any difference from the gate to ground i might be able to say this is the faulty mosfet but we've already proven really we have at least two one on each side the other option just to take the mosfets out and see what we have yeah we may end up doing that but let's do it the interesting way so first of all we'll just use a multimeter gate to ground on all four mosfets what do we see does it tell us anything if it doesn't, we stick some voltage in there, see if something gets hot. We stick some voltage in there, we see if something gets hot. If nothing happens, either way, conclusively, we'll take the MOSFETs out. So we're ready to try this. The easiest way, I think, is to take a crocodile clip that's connected to the power supply, the negative, and I'm just going to clip that onto ground on the motherboard, get a good connection. Should be fine. Nope, it fell off. Let's go again. I think that will do just fine. What voltage to use? Well, I've got it set to three volts. I mean, if it's going to draw a lot of current, then that is effectively going to go down very low. I'll turn the current down a bit, in fact, so the current's fairly low. But although we probably still have circuitry on the V core, okay, the CPU isn't here, but that is there. These points, because the inductor's not in, are now disconnected from that. So I'm not really too worried about what voltage i put in but i'm fairly sure if we do that and we just touch this onto where the inductor came from the voltage will go to zero yeah just about 1.29 amps okay so that's drawing current and the same from this side about the same okay so let's get the thermal camera let's see if anything's warming up Okay, uh, see it's working just fine. So let's stick some current into here and see if something gets warm. Well, apart from my fingers obviously holding that on, nothing really, okay. I'm not particularly surprised by that. Anything down here? No. I'll take the macro lens off the camera so this just comes off I can now get quite a bit further away with it okay let's go again so current if you've got I would class like a dead short like this appears to be the chances are something isn't going to warm up okay Let's increase the current a bit more. So, on here, let's give it a bit more. It's two and a half amps going in there now. Anything warming? No. No. Raise us up much higher. Just doing around the board, but I can't see it being anything over here. So effectively, nothing is warming up at all. Okay. 
No. Let's go on this side. So from here, again, good two and a half amps going in. And I don't see anything warming up. Let's go a bit more. Four over four amps. Now anything? No. So whatever is short is effectively a dead short. If something has zero resistance and it can't dissipate any watts because watts is current times voltage. And if the voltage across it is zero because the resistance ohms is zero, therefore the wattage is zero, yeah? The thermal camera is definitely working. There's nothing warm there at all. Can we get a bit more into it? That's as much as I can get into is five amps, okay? Anything? No. No. Go for this side. Five amps. No. So the thermal camera tells us nothing. Next thing then, let's remove these MOSFETs. To do this, I'll remove this plastic and I'll probably remove these capacitors as well because it's likely hood they'll just explode if they get too hot and they probably will get hot. So let's get this off first and then at least these two. I mean, those are a fair distance from there, but certainly these two capacitors I would like to take off the board. So let's remove these. I do have another idea where this short might be if they aren't here, yeah, if it isn't these. So if there's still a short on this side after I've removed these, I'm not going to take the ones off the other side. I've got another idea where the problem might be that might well affect both sides actually. And quite often the cause is a single fault. But since we're here, and we're enjoying investigating all this. Let's have a look. I'll add some fresh solder to these, but this probably isn't going to help much because there'll be a connection under this tab effectively to the board and I can't get solder under it. So this isn't going to help that much in the desoldering process, but at least I'll help on these two pins, I guess. Okay, can't get anything, any solder under here anyway, okay, so, hot air. I've removed these capacitors, as I said, the other two are still in, but they are some distance away. Let's see if we can get these off without accidentally unsoldering anything else. This will take a fair amount of heat to do this. Okay. Okay. Right, the first question is, as a short dog, I have a feeling it won't have done it. I just think it's one of those days. Okay, it's still hot, but we can test it. So, short. Well, yes, in fact, the short has gone. Okay, so they were both short, or one of them was. And this side, still reads short. 
as I would expect from what I've seen so far. I'll tell you though, when I finish this, what the other thoughts was that I did have, if the short was still there. Okay, so we have these. There's a little plastic jumper here. I'll take the jumper off. I won't bother trying to solder the pin header. If it gets melted, I can put a new one. What I can just do is just check the MOSFET side unsoldered. These should be short if everything is making sense. Yeah, that one's short. Yep, they're both short. Okay. Let's do these other two. Okay, I'll try and sort of get the air not too close to these capacitors. I probably should remove them really, but let's see, I think we'll be okay. Swap hands, it's easy for me. off that's off so we get these ones okay short short on the board Short's gone. The short's gone. So we definitely have got rid of the short. Right, the other thing that did occur to me. Is that there's a problem with the controller chip. I'll draw it back on the little diagram I drew and I'm sure this will make perfect sense. Sorry guys, I forgot to hit record and I was drawing this, but I'll show you what I mean. So, these four pairs of MOSFETs are driven by the Portsmouth modulator controller. And we'll have a connection going to the gates here. So we call this phase one high side MOSFET. It'll have a connection going to this pair, phase two high side MOSFET. It'll have a connection to these pair phase one low side MOSFET, so an LS in there, low side, and again I'll have connection to these two, which is phase two low side MOSFET. So there's four drive signals coming out the pulse with modulator controller. It doesn't have eight, although there's eight MOSFETs, because these are in pairs, and they will have from the gate going to the controller chip through a resistor. So you'll have something like this, uh, so these are the Phase one low side, so a resistor will connect to there, a resistor to there, so that one pin will drive them both, and there'll probably be resistors to ground as well. So you'll have something like that, and again, you'll have the next pair running from this one, and so on with resistors. Now, there's lots of resistors in this, and the short can't be in the controller because you're coming through resistors. But what you do have is these other two connections. I've drawn them here. So you have phase one and phase two, okay? And this connects from the junction between the high side and low side and the inductor coil directly back to the chip, phase one, phase two, okay? Could be through a resistor, but often it's just a direct connection. Now, what these connections are for is so that the Portsmouth modulator knows when the MOSFETs have switched off. Now, you might say, well, hang on, Rich, the pulse width modulator is, is what's switching the MOSFETs on and off. So therefore, it knows full well when they switched on and switched off because that's what's doing it. And that is true, but 
when you switch a MOSFET off or on for that matter, it doesn't switch on or off instantly. There is a very short amount of time, microseconds, picoseconds maybe, which it takes that MOSFET to go from conducting to non-conducting, okay. And this controller is switching these alternately on and off. And the same for those two. And it must always switch one off before it switches the other one on. If it ever switched on at the same time, then you'll have a short from 12 watts to the ground. So, although the controller is telling the MOSFET to switch off, it needs to know, has the MOSFET switched off now? That's this little bit of delay. And that's why it monitors this point and this point. And on a four or eight phase VRM, there's more. Single phase is just one. But it monitors these junctions between the coil and the MOSFETs. And that's how it knows, yes, it's switched off. I can switch the other one on. Now, if you had a short circuit inside here, it's quite feasible that phase two and phase one are shorting to ground uh, internally. And that would effectively give the indication that we had a short on both sides. But you'd expect that to get hot. But there again, you see, you'd expect these to get hot when they injected current. Why didn't it get hot? Well, as I said, and I mentioned before, things get hot because they generate heat. And heat is watts. Yeah. And watts equals voltage times current. Voltage is a voltage across the short, and current is a current flowing through it. Now, when we talk about short, we normally mean a very low resistance. And a very low resistance is still a resistance. So there's still a voltage dropped across it. Yeah? And that is multiplied by the current if the current is high it generates some wattage it gets hot in our case i think we had like a dead short and these components are bolted not bolted sorry are soldered directly to the ground plane or power planes in the circuit board so they can dissipate a lot of heat the fact they are basically a dead short means that there's very little heat being generated anyway because if this is zero Zero times however much you want is still zero watts. And that's why it didn't get hot. There was probably the weeds were getting a bit warm. I didn't measure that. The weeds from the power supply, because obviously current was flowing somewhere, and we could see on the power supply there was a very small voltage drop. But even then, if the voltage drop on the power supply was 0.1 of a volt or 0.2 of a volt at 5 amps, you're still only talking half a watt or 1 watt. And when that is distributed into a large heat sink, i.e. the power plane or a ground plane, nothing's going to warm up. Let's see if we can get some replacement MOSFETs. Hmm. Well, I've just given a clean to get the flux of them, so let's have a look. Uh, 0274A, LD10T0D, that's us say. LD1010D. Okay, let's see if we can find a data sheet and let's see which is the correct number out of all those. Well, it's been searched for before. Let's see. Yeah, N channel power J FET. So that is actually the correct number. Okay, let's see if we can get these things from AliExpress or anywhere else for that matter. Well, yeah, we can get them. We can get five of them for one euro fifteen. These are probably okay. I ordered ten of them, I think. It's very unlikely these will be fake. It just isn't worth faking stuff like this. They're so cheap and they're probably not a huge demand for them as such. So I ordered ten of those. I don't have them at the moment, which means we'll have to wait a little bit. What we haven't figured out is why this failed, so that would be another thing. If it failed due to a faulty CPU, well, we can stick another one in, but we can also measure the resistance of our CPU against a known good one. That gives an idea. 
it could have failed due to a problem with the controller. The fact we don't have a short to the gate pin makes me think the controller is probably okay in as much as it survived what happened to these MOSFETs. They just shorted to ground anyway. So I think probably the controller will be okay, but who knows, yeah, something else. But you know, we have to start somewhere. So I'll order 10 of these and then we can continue with this and see if we can fix it. But we certainly, I think, learned some stuff there. That was an interesting fault. Quite gratifying to find out what the problem actually is. So I hope you enjoyed that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.